Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start. So we can be sure to give John a lot of time. Um, as you can tell, this is an ad hoc lecture. So um, I'm actually gonna run it a little bit different uh, than I usually do. I normally um, I, I still would preferably time given want to break into groups at the end to have a little bit of discussion. Um, but again, since I have notes prepared and it's kind of an ad hoc lecture, I will also be taking questions or objections throughout. So please, if you have any questions or problems throughout, just raise your hand because again, and I'll call as soon as I'm confident to do so. Um, so a little bit different, and again, I like to break into the groups after, but we'll see how it goes. We'll do a live. <laughs> you go write it, we'll do a live. Okay, so my topic um, is uh, ethics, especially revolutionary ethics. Um, so I'm gonna go over the main three branches um, of ethics which are going to be consequentialist, uh, virtue ethics, or eretaic ethics, and then deontological ethics. Um, but of course, this is not revolutionary ethics. So I'll also link them to their nearest, as I see it, and again, this is a somewhat idiosyncratic uh, interpretation that doesn't necessarily correspond exactly to what it is. Um, but I'm also going to link them to their revolutionary ethics that follow out of them. So, I will be doing consequentialism as linked to uh, social democracy as a quote-unquote revolutionary movement. Um, I will be doing eretaic uh, ethics as linked to um, Foucault initially, and then Antonio Negri's empire, the ethics found in that, um, the biopolitical ethics. Uh, and then I will be doing deontological ethics um, primarily through Kant, and then I will be uh, time permitting and competency permitting going through Alain Badiou's ethics of being and the revolutionary ethics that follow out of that. Um, so that's sort of the game plan. Um, I'm going to start with what I see as the worst form of ethics um, and the least revolutionary form of ethics, which is consequentialism. So consequentialism is a actually very broad uh, field of ethics of which utilitarianism, which most people are familiar with, is just a small aspect. Um, so consequentialism is basically, as its name implies, concerned with the consequences of one's actions. Now utilitarianism is the easiest form of consequentialism to understand. This is um, posed by John Stuart Mill, who is an avowed socialist. Uh, however much we want to accept that is actually the case, is up in the air, but he, he self-identifies as a socialist of a variety. Um, so what is utilitarianism, which will give us a good understanding of, of what consequentialism looks like and so we can apply it to consequentialism in general? Well, utilitarian ethics uh, basically judge happiness or pleasure. And this goes by the name utility, right? So you have utility insofar as you have pleasure, you have disutility insofar as you have pain or displeasure, right? So the basic thesis of utilitarianism, uh, utilitarianism is that what is ethical or moral is, of course, the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest number of people, right? This would make it it's pretty commonsensical. There's not, um, you know, some hidden subtext. If you view pleasure as the best and highest good and displeasure as the worst sort of good, then you would want, again, the greatest pleasure for the greatest number of people. Now, there's all sorts of ways of measuring this, and Mill, in fact, notes that uh, the pleasure of, I don't know, eating a sundae or the pleasure of having sex is, is a pleasure and should be counted, but there are higher pleasures. Um, for example, reading philosophy or playing music or painting or having friends and family who care for you. These sorts of things, of course, would be a higher good. So um, the one objection to utilitarianism is that, you know, all it wants to do is make us animals is really poorly founded. Um, again, the higher pleasures would always pretty much have preference. Um, as long as you're not murdering people to use their blood for your painting, you're probably going to be in pretty good shape. Um, now, here's the thing, though. You run into certain problems. Uh, the most uh, famous objection to consequentialism is this. You have someone who, well, I'll, I'll frame it in the American context. You have a black man who is accused of raping and murdering a young white girl in the South. It has to be in the South because that would 
you know, never be alleged anywhere else. Um, but in any case, right, so you have this uh, black man who's alleged to rape and murder this young girl. And the population is howling for his blood. And the judge uh, is given evidence, demonstrable evidence, that, as a matter of fact, this man didn't do it. And in fact, the man who did it is a well-respected, let's say, white preacher in the community. And the community will never believe that this black man is innocent, where this upstanding pillar of the community, white preacher, is guilty. And so if you find or you know, discard the evidence as you know, faked or fraud, then there's going to be a massive race riot um, where numerous black people are going to be killed, numerous white people are going to be killed, and um, race relations are going to be even further hurt. So in a utilitarian perspective, what should one do then? It becomes quite clear. Many are going to die if you uh, rule this man innocent, whereas if you rule him guilty, then only he dies. And of course, that's unfortunate. But as a good utilitarian, right, the greatest good for the greatest number. Um, obviously, most of you could probably see why this is problematic. So what happens is recently, um, last 100 years or so, utilitarianism has become, which is just uh, a measure of pleasure, much more sophisticated. Now, it, it deserves the, t uh, the name of consequentialism. In this case, you're no longer concerned with pleasure as such, right, or utility as such, but utility and pleasure are merely one sort of good that a society has, right? So if you approach it from this perspective, there are many different goods that a society has. One is rule of law. Now that, for a consequentialist, needn't be the overriding good, but it's a good that needs to be considered against, for example, the individuals who will die. Because if you don't respect rule of law, then it becomes, in a consequentialist perspective, more likely as rule of law becomes less and less important, right, that more and more abuses are going to occur. So in the long run, right, even though you may have a race riot now, the degradation of the rule of law in the future, right, as a future consequence, is going to be the more pragmatic course of action. Right? So this is the more sophisticated version of consequentialism. And we can, we can list all sorts of goods that people value. Right? Um, health, uh, pleasure, entertainment, um, education, uh, sexual freedom, um, the use of drugs, alcohol, and of course, right, the converse. Any damages caused by these, any disintegrations caused by these, any degradations caused by these. Right? And so this would be a form of weighing public utility. Uh, or, I'm sorry, utility is again just pleasure, qua, happiness, public consequences. So how does this play out as a revolutionary theory? Well, uh, it's pretty easily. Social democracy is the way in which consequentialism plays out. If we have a group of people who all have different consequences weighed in different ways, how do we adjudicate where those consequences alter? Well, what we do is we decide democratically. Now, this does, in a certain sort of way, lend itself to a certain sort of anti-capitalism. Because as a matter of fact, under corporate capitalism, uh, for example, cap uh, capitalist lobbyists can lobby for corporations that experience no real pleasure, although they might have consequences of some variety, um, for example, we might have a consequence of how the economy is doing or something like that. Um, but as a matter of fact, most of us are very hurt by capitalism, both here in America and in the world, right? So, of course, we would want to change this. Well, how would a social democrat do so? Well, through the weighing of democratic processes. You would elect candidates who weren't corrupt, you would recall the ones that are, and you would gradually transition from socialism, or uh, I'm sorry, Freudian slip there, from capitalism to socialism. socialism. Yeah, and then <laughs> socialism to communism or whatever. Well, here's the additional, here's the problem with this. Oh, here's the problem as I see it with this. Social democracy then can never be revolutionary. And there's a really good reason why social democracy can never be revolutionary. Anytime you have a revolution, 
you are going to have a bunch of negative consequences. Uh, not the least of which, probably at least a few people, if not a mass of people, are going to find themselves with the terminal case of lead poisoning. Right? So social democracy, under a consequentialist ethic, would never become a revolutionary theory as such. And I think this is one of the greatest failings of consequentialism as an ethic and or social democracy as a, uh, as a movement, right? as an ethical sort of movement. Um, so again, that, that'd be social democracy. And I think, it, I think it's quite clear how that links consequentialism to the practice of social democracy. Essentially, you will never have a reason to believe that a revolution will ever be worth the cost or the risks involved in that consequence in order to right, abolish capitalism. So, of course, being the good Marxist-Leninist I am, I would dismiss both consequentialism and social democracy as revisionist. Sorry, question. What about a um, uh, consequentialist uh, reforming of, of, of the values that you were speaking of, the goods, uh, to, to be something like you know, economic or social justice or something? Could that allow them for a revolution, perhaps? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, actually, do, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna get this, and then if you have a question or response, we'll go. We're doing a little different format for those of you who just came in, um, which is I'm answering questions as we go. Well, here's the thing. Perhaps theoretically, in the incredibly logically abstract. But here's the thing: if you have any sort of revolution that that would really constitute any sort of revolution you're going to have a lot of disutility, almost certainly capitalists losing their property, massive dislocation, both economic and political. And it's a problem of epistemology. How do we know what's going to happen with a revolution? Right? A revolution is itself so variable, you could never, I believe, from a consequentialist perspective, um, adequately judge when, it be, when essentially things have been, become so bad that it's worth courting the danger of a revolution itself. Because that would be a massive destabilization. Some notable exceptions. Maybe in Nazi Germany. Maybe in Mussolini's Italy. right? Because things would be so bad that in that case, the disutility or the bad consequences of destabilizing your government and attempting to overthrow it might possibly be greater right, than the you know, disutility of allowing the regime. But can you see why that would be an incredibly outside possibility? I, I mean, and if not, feel free to come with an argument. If I understood you correctly, when you move away from utilitarianism and, and towards um, the consequentialism that comes from, we're not talking about just utility anymore. We're talking about a certain type of goods that are defined. I think what John's question is, why not define those goods differently, like social justice being a good rather than pleasure, um, for instance. Like we're talking about the displeasure that would come from um, a revolution, but um, but only if you define um, good consequences as pleasure does that matter. Well, what I would say to you is this: the actual difficulty is not in what sort of consequences are defined; it's in the notion of a revolution, um, because. For any consequentialism, it has to have a way of weighing everyone's desires. So, for example, I can have a desire and a, a set of consequences, but what weighs my set of consequences, my set of values, against, say, Bill Gates, Paris Hilton? Well, for most consequentialists, the only adjudicator in that, that, that could possibly be, would be a democracy. Right? And so, again, yeah, if you abstractly define revolution as just an alter, a gradual alteration through democratic means, yeah, okay. But when we look at anything that is called a revolution and what that looks like, it never looks anything like that. So, yeah, I mean, abstractly, so do you see why it's not a problem of defining terms of goods or values? It's a problem of defining revolution, at least as I see it. I mean, does that... Make sense? Um, in addition to that, it seems, I mean, we're, when talking about consequences, it, it seems to be a huge factor. Like, I, I agree with you to, to the extent that predicting consequences is really difficult. When saying 
that you can't justify a revolution with consequences. It, because of the reason that you presented is only because because you're setting a limit to how far ahead we can. I I, mean, I would argue that one um, one would uh, most that are interested in revolution are interested in it because of the consequences that it will bring. Um, but of course, they're going to be within a certain time frame. Um, there's going to be tremendous disutility. Um, it just seems like how far ahead you're looking is like a huge factor in this. Um, from this perspective, from this angle. Well, I mean, yeah. Here's the thing, though. Just historically speaking, most consequential, most consequentialist line of thought, do as as a matter of fact, do not lead to revolutionary action. If you look at the revolutionaries who actually engage in revolution, they're almost never guided by the consequences. What they're guided by, and I'll get into this a little bit later, is a notion of justice, um, which is push, essentially, on everyone, equally, um, although perhaps imperfectly. But as a matter of fact, those who consider the consequences usually become social democrats and fight for things, for example, is it, what are the likely utilities or consequences of having an armed insurrection that very well could fail or plunge the country into civil war for an unknown amount of years, and what is the likely consequences of fighting for a 50 cent increase in wage, right? The fight for a 50 cent increase of wage, while not particularly heroic sounding, makes perfect sense um, because, right, the utility of that 50 cent increase can easily be determined, whereas, right, the, the consequences of armed insurrection against the government and the likely outcome of that are incredibly obscure, right, I mean, in, in its prediction. So, I mean, yeah, some, perhaps, perhaps, again, in a very theoretical way, you could say, oh, well, in some, well, I, ironically, capitalists are most critical of socialists who try to justify things in consequentialist terms, yeah, right? Oh, uh, just one, one last thing, right? Most capitalists do not believe in a glorious socialist future. And given, as of now, the outcome of anarchism, of uh, Leninism, of Marxism, of all the other radical philosophies and politics, it seems very unlikely to believe in that glorious, shining future of, of socialism. But yeah, and I, I actually would argue that most utilitarian consequentialist ethics actually are capitalist ethics. If you think about the way people weigh cost-benefit analysis over certain things, and then make judgments from that. And, and here's an actual, another example. Um, I participated in an ethics poll, and the case I had was over West Papua and whether to stop mining. And the opponent I had literally gave this argument. He said, um, if you look at the economic situation of the mining, yeah, sure, it's deplorable, but in the macro scale of right, economics of the world, it's applying copper in these various places and giving various benefits to Indonesians. And if you stop that, that's going to cause a greater disutility to more people. And so the, it's therefore justified that we should continue mining in West Papua, which obviously is exterminating people and destroying the environment. But those, those those harms uh, outweigh the benefit. Don't outweigh the benefit of people getting hospitals, et cetera, et cetera, humanitarian, blah blah blah. blah. Okay. Maybe we can talk about this when we get into the, like the virtue ethics and ontology. But I see um, justice as a consequence. Like if, if we're able to, like maybe it's just semantics, or maybe it's like, uh, yeah, maybe it's just semantics. But I see like world global justice as a consequence, and so not looking to that as a as a consequence. Yeah, and if I if I could, I'll just move into virtue ethics now, or eretaic ethics. Erete, of course, is the Greek word for uh, of good quality, essentially. Um, so eretaic ethics, acts are good or bad relative to the character of, uh, of the person. Now, this is a little bit of a confusing term, but eretaic ethics are not judged based on intention, and they're not judged based on outcome as such. So let me give an example. Uh, I may have a friend who, uh, who I, this is again a cliche example. I may have a friend whose dog is run over, and they ask, well, did he suffer? Now, here's the thing. If I say, no, he didn't suffer, or, no, he didn't suffer because I'm concerned about my, my friend's feelings, 
Uh, it doesn't help anything for them to know that their dog, you know, squealed for hours until someone put it down. Um, then that's actually of a virtue because I am exhibiting concern for my friend, right? So that would be lying to them as showing concern. But there's also an alternative, right? If my friend asks, well, did my dog suffer? If I value and I, I, I view my front friend as strong and deserving of the truth and I have a respect towards them and I say, yes, they suffered very much, but I do so out of a, a friendship and concern for that individual, that also could be virtuous. Now, the flip side is um, if they ask if the dog suffered and I say, no, it didn't suffer, but that's because I don't really want to deal with the emotions that that person would have, you know, their crying or their heartbreak, and I'm just scared of any interaction, even though I'm lying to them, right, in one instance it might be virtuous. In this case, it wouldn't. Right? And if I tell them, oh, yeah, yeah, your dog squealed like a, uh, you know, a bloody hound and the tire was on it, and you know, it was just, yeah, it was a mess. It was just awful. I'd hate to be that dog. Right? You'll notice I'm not being virtuous. I'm not, it's not truth or courage that is the virtue I'm, I'm pushing. In fact, it's the vice, the viciousness of indifference. Right? So you'll notice it's not about intention. It's not about consequence. It's about the relation of our ethics, right, of our virtues and vices to ourselves. Um, the most famous of these ancient uh, eretic ethicists would, of course, be Aristotle, right? And he has a whole range of virtues from courage to modesty um, to liberality, right, donating to friends. Um, temperance. Yeah, temperance. Um, and so, right, these would be eretic notions. Well, um, they, they kind of fall to the wayside, but there's actually a revival, and there's a very strong critical revival um, yeah, through, through the uh, French thinker Michel Foucault. And what Foucault notices is that we have these institutions of power, these disciplinary institutions of power, like schools, like prisons, uh, like the internet, like police stations, um, like information, and they begin conditioning us in certain ways. And when we're not forced by the state, we're not forced by the, per se by the police, but we arrange ourselves in certain actions, right? We have a student-teacher relationship, and we see that as fixed. If we have a parent-child relationship, if we have a male-female relationship in which the female has a submissive role and the male a dominant role in society, these begin to condition us, right? And there's no essential law. It's about social conditioning. And for Foucault, this goes by the term biopower, right? And uh, so what you have is you have this biopolitical power that is constantly affecting us. And a good place to look at this would be History of Sexuality, Volume 1, um, which I'm primarily drawing. These sort of forces, which are never unitary, right? They're always split in different directions, um, are discursive. Right? They generate discourse, they generate words, they generate concepts. Uh, this would be what Foucault calls knowledge power. Right? And the very knowledge itself is transformative in, a, in, a power, in the way of power, which again is not to be understood as violence, as coercion, right? but just as the way we go. Uh, so a, a good thing is, I can know how good of a student you are by what sort of grades you get. Right? That knowledge that I'm collecting about you through your assignments, through your tests, is also a power to judge or censure you uh, based on your actions, right? So this is biopower and it's biopolitical. Now this itself is a critical conception of virtue ethics, but not, that, not yet a revolutionary conception of ethics. So let's go to the revolutionary conception of ethics. The primary theorists of these revolutionary conception of ethics, of virtue ethics, and again, this is a somewhat insat, uh, idiosyncratic interpretation, but I think it falls within the discourse, would be Anten uh, Antonio Negri and Michael Hart. And you can find this uh, most clearly in their book, Empire. And so in Empire, they use biopower, right, which we were just talking about Foucault, and they assign it a characteristic. Those actions that support capitalism so, right, this would be paying for music on iTunes, going to a 9 to 5 job, uh, voting Republican, um, or, vote, or perhaps even voting Democratic, 
uh, you know, being against gay rights, being against minorities, right? These would be capitalist, uh, a capitalist vice, right? Or, you know, virtue, depending on your perspective, they would call it a viciousness. But then there's also a form of virtue, communist actions, right? So when you download music illegally, when you dumpster dive instead of buy food, uh, when you play shows and, you know, live off that, you know, and have your unalienated artistic, you know, experience rather than being, a, you know, dominated by the bourgeois capitalist, you know, spectacle, right? All of these would be communist actions, right? Which would then resist capitalism, right? So for them, we are a composite of different discourses. We do some capitalist things we do some communist things, right? And this is a bit of a, a turn away from the traditional Marxist notion of class because, as you can see, right, we all do, we all include different aspects, right? Now, for Foucault, what is a revolution? A revolution is where the balance of power of one discourse outweighs the balance of power of another, right? If you have biopower and they're meeting and they're conflicting, the dominant form of biopower is going to be the one that most people have. Well, for Negri and Hart, this is also quite evident. When the proletariat, or as they call it, multitude, which can include, well, pretty much anyone, uh, you know, when the multitude has a greater level of power, when the multitude in the world engages in spontaneous, imminent resistances, um, as their phrase for doing things is, um, more communist than empire, right, which is the domineering, you know, neo-capitalism that transcends all national borders, then once multitude has more power, empire will collapse or fall, or we'll have a revolution and we'll have spontaneous uh, free individuals. Well, what's the problem with this? Well, the problem is, at what point does one adjudicate the logic of capital? Um, here's an example, open source software. How does one judge that? Well, that's clearly communist, right? Because it's free, it's on the internet, anyone can download it, anyone can use it. However, there's an interesting feature. Linux has become one of the mainstays of the internet. It's very stable, it's very secure. So what happens is capitalists basically use this base of free software and then make their money off issuing services, right? You're, most people will need someone to compile their Linux for them, so you can make, charge money off that rep. If they have any problems, they can charge money off that rep. And basically what you have is the commons become the ground for capital to appropriate. So in this case, when you, uh, let's take a band like, say, Fugazi, who never sold out by any, any means, right? They, they never sold merch, they played local shows, they never signed a, uh, to a major label, even though they were asked constantly. Okay, but their music then became appropriated by capital and passed along to all of these pop bands, right? So at what point can your communist actions not be appropriated by the capitalists? And so, Although this is certainly better than social democratic ethics, I, of course, feel it falls short. Yeah, there's several things to say on this, obviously. But one of them, actually, if you think about virtue as conceived in Greece, I'm thinking mostly in the dialogue of Mino by Plato. Mino's first definition of what virtue is is simply it's oh, the virtue between a man and his woman, uh, the virtue of the master and the slave, et cetera, et cetera, and it's these various things. And um, obviously, it's rejected, but we should keep in mind, right? There's a, there's a virtue for slaves. It's to be subservient to your master, uh, not get out of line, do your work, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's no universal ethic. It's, it's solely dependent on your actual position. And the very fact that in these like autonomous Marxist conceptions of class, they think everybody can be revolutionary in a sense. Um, workers, teachers, housewives, uh, students, et cetera, et cetera. And, I, I, it seems to me that the very notion of biopower as itself playing out that doesn't lead to any sort of revolutionary practice because capital tends to swallow everything. And when you engage in positive projects, they get swallowed by capital. 
Yeah, well, I mean, and it's worth noting, Crime Think puts out a lot of books that are for sale to make them money. Crime Think being this uh, lifestyle anarchist where you dumpster dive and you put subversive messages on corporate ads and all that jazz. Um, so let's move to the final main branch, uh, which is deontology. Uh, and deontology is, I believe, Greek for duty-based ethics. Um, ontology, right, it's worth noting, is from being. And Kant, of course, is the most famous deontologist. And so the basic reasoning for Kant is, look, we're all human beings, which means we all have universal reason. And it's this universal reason that grounds all of us. We all have it. We all can use it. We don't necessarily, we don't necessarily use it, but we all could use it. So what happens is we have these imperatives, right? These commands on how to do things, right? Because reason presents us with the world, and we interact with that world, and there's all that jazz. There are two kinds of imperatives. There's a hypothetical imperative, which is based on our situation, and there's a categorical imperative, which is a pure imperative of reason. So, for example, I might have. A, a, a categorical imperative of self-preservation, we'll say. Well, a hypothetical uh, imperative, right, is subordinated to the categorical imperative. So, for example, I have a, a self-preservation um, imperative, and so I need to eat, right? But eating is not a categorical imperative, right? It's a means, it's a selection of how to obtain that. So, um, Kant formulates his categorical imperative in a couple of interesting ways. Um, I'm just going to go over the two main uh, formulations of the categorical imperative, but he has a bunch of them, so I'd highly encourage you to look them up. Um, the first and most famous is, acts only in according to the maxim where you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. So a maxim is a reason for action, like self-preservation, or I want something, uh, and then you have to will it as though everyone could also will it. So again, this is where a lot of people get hung up. The, you will a categorical imperative, you don't will a hypothetical imperative, right? Everyone can will to do the that basic necessities of self-preservation, right? Because if we all didn't, the human, the human race would be extinguished. So we could categorically uh, will self-preservation, right? This would make perfect sense. What we can't do is we can't all will to go to the bathroom at the same time, right? We clog the pipes, they would break, et cetera, et cetera. This is not a problem because, again, that's a hypothetical imperative. But the main imperative, the categorical imperative of self-preservation, which, unless you want your kidneys exploding, occasionally in, uh, you know, entails from time to time using the facilities, we can still will that. Right? So this is where a lot of people get hung up. It's not about willing a hypothetical, it's about willing a categorical. Right? It needs to be universally applicable to everyone at all times. Just really quickly though, it's about um, making it so there's not an exclusive right for you to do something that others can't do. Yeah, lying is the primary example. Yeah. Right? If I lie to someone, what I have to do is I have to will myself as an exception. Right? Because why would anyone believe my lie? Well, people believe lies because, generally speaking, everyone tells the truth, right? The vast majority of the time, you tell the truth, and the only reason you get away with a lie is because everyone expects you to tell the truth, right? So this is the hypocrisy of right, not having a categorical imperative. I have willed myself as an exception to the rule. The rule is everyone tells the truth except for me, so then I can get away with it. Right? And so this is how that, that maxim works. I need to make it a universal law. And if I made lying a universal law, no one would believe anyone anyway, and I couldn't get away with my lie. Right? So you'll see how that doesn't work. The next is act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or the person of any other, always at the same time as an end, nearly as a means. Or not merely as a means. Now this is also another place where people get hung up not merely as a means. So if I say, hey, could you do me a favor and uh, get me a drink of water? And they go, sure. I'm not using you merely as a means, right? Because you have a choice in the matter, right? I am trusting to your autonomy, right? Your right to choose on whether to give me a drink of water or not. 
So simply saying, hey, could you do something for me, is not in and of itself a violation of autonomy or of using people. Right? It's a merely as a means. So this, of course, throws us into autonomy. What is autonomy? Uh, most people think of this as free will. This is incorrect. Um, autonomy is our ability to in choose our imperatives. I cannot stress this enough. This is what the free will means. It doesn't mean being able to do anything at all times, in all ways, however we want. It means being able to choose our imperatives. So let me give two examples, one of which violates someone's autonomy, and one that does not. So for example, anyone here like Edgar Allan Poe? Um, I'll go with yes. OK, very good. Um, I, 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 yes, I forget exactly what the, um, uh, what the name of the story is, so if anyone has it, feel free to shout it out. But what happens is one dude really, really hates another dude. Now, of course, this isn't very descriptive because all toes like that. Um, but he says, what you should do is you should come to the catacombs because I have a cask of Amontillado, right? It's, uh, I believe it's a wine or a liquor, and it's really good. So he says, come to the catacombs, and I have a cask of Amontillado. He then proceeds to trap him and wall him into the wall uh, so he dies, right? Okay, so here's why that violates the autonomy. The choice being offered is come to the catacombs and have alcohol with me, or don't come to the catacombs and have alcohol with me, right? But as a matter of fact, it violates his autonomy because the real choice is come to the catacombs and have me kill you, or don't come to the catacombs and have me not kill you, right? You'll notice if you offered him that choice, uh, barring some suicidal aggressivity, it's very unlikely that he would come to the catacombs. Let's compare this with Maximilien Robespierre's and the Committee of Public Safety, Law of the Maximum. What the Law of the Maximum says is there is a maximum on the price of bread. And if you hoard bread, or you sell bread at above that cost, um, you will get a haircut a little off the top. Uh, if you don't know, this is one of the jokes of the guillotine, you know, you're getting a haircut, just a little off the top. This does not violate anyone's autonomy. There is a clear law, which is, if you try to hoard or sell bread for a price greater than the law of the maximum, we will kill you. Now you are free to choose, right? And so you'll notice, it is not about having your freedom infringed, or next time you hear a libertarian say, well, I hate the government because it infringes on my autonomy, the only way it infringes on your autonomy is if it says that it's going to do something which it doesn't, which of course, again, our current government does all the time. But that is not an essential argument against the state proper. The state can still respect autonomy and remain incredibly repressive so long as the laws are clear. Uh, there's one real big exception, um, and, and this, is, this is a sort of oppression that is not acceptable. Nazism. Surprise, surprise. The reason why Nazism is not acceptable is because a Jew, for Nazis, right, you could have an incredible, theoretically, it would still be a violation of autonomy, um, but if you are radically Christian and not particularly observant or bright, you could outlaw Judaism, but then allow any Jew to convert to Christianity. This would be a terrible system. It would almost certainly be unjust. But if you have a really distorted worldview, it could theoretically be possible. The Nazis did not do this. There was nothing in the freedom of the Jews to cease being a Jew. And so this was a fundamental violation of autonomy right, in, in the most core way. So again, there are different uh, variations to be, to be had. And then I'm going to go very quickly, as much as possible. Sorry, John. I'm taking forever. Go, uh, go through the revolutionary ethics that I hold, uh, which is Alain Badu. Now, a brief background on Alain Badu. Alain Badu follows the psychoanalytic uh, philosopher, or anti-philosopher, if you please, 
of Jacques Lacan. Now, Jacques Lacan notice, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, Jacques Lacan notices, you say that fast, it sounds like a rapper name. Jacques Lacan. Yeah, um, he noticed something very interesting, um, which is, it's not a matter, all deontological ethics, um, historically, people have thought that duty was juxtaposed against desire. But what Lacan notices is, no, as a matter of fact, all duties that we have and we give to ourselves sustain our desire and, in turn, right, our, uh, in turn generate the desire. Now, for Lacan, then, the fundamental ethical question is a question of giving in. And he forms this as betraying our desire. Um, and, of course, the very precise name for betraying one's desire is happiness. Because for Lacan, what our desire is, is a demand without satisfaction. To hold to your desire, to hold a duty to your desire, is not to have found an even place in the world, but to have a profoundly disjointed place in the world. One that is interrupted, that is circling, that is disrupted by desire itself. And so the duty that I will briefly talk about as uh, the superego or terror is merely the flip side of desire itself. So duty and desire are linked. And to give in is to cease to desire, which doesn't mean to be want. Right? You can want a lot of things. To be perfectly comfortable with your, uh, your Nintendo Wii and a crummy minimum wage job and a single apartment doesn't mean right, you can want all those things or want a sandwich, right? but that's not the essence of desire. Right? A desire is a demand without satisfaction. So let us move to the moment to revolutionary desire, which is best exemplified by the ontology of Alain Badiou, and I would recommend the theory of the subject. For these ethics, these are not an ethics of good and bad. Most deontologists, right, Kant believes that we're all subjects, we're all moral subjects. For Badiou, we are not all subjects. To be a subject is to be exceptional. And subjects themselves are transitory and easily disrupted. So what it means to give in is not to become a bad subject, an evil subject. To give in is to be not a subject at all. So what are the four virtues of Elaine Badiou? Very quickly, they are anxiety against courage, the superego, later called terror, against justice. Now, what's important to note, it is not, even though they are juxtaposed, it is not courage without anxiety. It is not justice without terror. But rather, all the virtues are the necessary components to generate a subject as such. So then, let us conceive, what would a revolutionary subject be? Going generally, anxiety for Badiou is the lack of a lack, right? lack being a desire. So what this is, is this is a truth as a whole. We are often presented with incredibly commonsensical truths. Communism is a failed system. So is anarchism. Right? At every given point, we have the truth of our existence, which is that capitalism is the only system that will work. It is the dominant system. And to do anything otherwise is foolish. It's this overfulness of the truth of capitalism that generates within us anxiety. Because the capitalist demand, and I'm going to go a little bit out of, out of order here, is the superego, right? The law, the terror of capitalism. We are always impelled. Or, I, I'm sorry, yeah, no, yeah, that's right. Um, and required and asked and exhorted to behave lawfully, right? And not just lawfully in the case that there's laws, right? But to behave in a certain way towards other people, right? For men, it is to objectify women. For women, it is to be objectified or sedu uh, to seduce men, right? This is the unspoken law of our sexual relationships. 
In our capitalist relationships, it is to have more money, to fight for uh, a better position, social position, to have a dominant social position, right? This is the very law of our society, which again, does not entail the pure legal aspect, but is rather the very super ego, right? The demand, the terror, the law that undergirds our society. So this law to have more, to be more, to buy more, to be, to enjoy more, generates an anxiety. Well, there are two other virtues. As a matter of fact, and, and this, is, this is an important thing, the vast majority of all people, the vast majority of all political parties, are only governed by these two features. The superego and anxiety. Look at the Democrats and Republicans. What are they governed by? The superego to win elections, right? Because they've reduced all the politics to electoral politics to hold more seats, to have the presidency, to have um, the Supreme Court, and the anxiety generated by that. So what are they missing? They are missing courage and justice. So what is courage? Courage is above all, and again, these are all linked, a call to justice. So what it is, is the recognition of the lack of a lack and a splitting of it. So what would courage mean today? Courage would mean Recognizing that we are inured in a capitalist system. We are unable to escape a capitalist system. And the law of our entire world and very existence is a capitalist law. And yet to call to something else. To recognize this. So it's important. You must, in order to be courageous, you must hold anxiety. There is no courage without anxiety. But you must call to justice. And what is justice? The justice, uh, okay, so going back to the superego, the superego is the very, uh, it's the, uh, again, I have the forcing consistency of being through law, but this is also the law as non-law. So let me do that, right? We have a law, but we will never satisfy it. We will never satisfy the capitalist demands on it. We will never satisfy the law of the demand for power, right? So the very law itself, the superego that is demanding us, is itself a non-law because it's uns insatiable, right? So what is justice? The justice is the recognition of the non-law in the law itself. To recognize that the law splits itself and that, uh, to put it in a somewhat grandiose uh, neo-leftist way, another world is possible, right? To recognize that this law is not the essential law, and to hold that justice is possible in the world. If you take all of these together, what do you get? You get a subject. In politics, unlike social democracy, where it's a matter of just weighing general opinion, Unlike Negri, where it's a matter of individuals or group of individuals engaging in either communist acts or capitalist acts, or as a matter of fact, both in varying degrees. What a revolutionary subject is, is that which, through anxiety, exhibits courage against the superego, against the terror of society, to call forth a justice and then produces effects of this revolutionary subjectivity. So, to, and, and this is the important point, that itself is the ethics. To have a being, to have a subject, and to betray that is not to be a bad subject. To be, betray that is to not be a subject at all. And the revolutionary name for the subject in politics is the party. And this is the essence of Badiou's revolutionary ethics, which, again, I would hold against all other ethics. Um, what are some comments, questions, objections? Will you, um, yes. will, will, you go, will you Will you go over the willing but hypothetical imperative problem again, like in your example with the bathroom? I, I didn't quite understand. Okay, so basically, um, a hypothetical 
I mean, by definition, what it is, but oh, okay. So it's it's any given means. Like for example, uh, cars. Or, or uh, here's another one: flying southwest. Right. If all of us try to fly southwest at the exact same time, there won't be enough seats. Um, so people who don't understand the difference between hypothetical and categorical and comparative will be like, oh, well then, no one can fly on airplanes because if everyone tries to fly at the exact same time on southwest, then no one can fly on southwest because there won't be enough seats. Right? But you'll notice that's a hypothetical. It's a means, not an end. The actual uh, categorical imperative is um, its right to uh, travel using the means of our society to get to locations that we would want to go. Right, that would be the maximum. And in principle, we could will, I mean, there might act, the only objection to that would actually be an environmentalist or a green objection, right? Because they would say, no, as a matter of fact, does that make sense? But, but saying, oh, no, there wouldn't be enough seats would not be inappropriate. The hypothetical applies to situation specifically. I think this is actually in the textbook, right? If you're going to go to the, all right, okay, if you're going to, I don't know like what if you're going to drive long, about, so. well, if you're going to drive long distances, you should probably put gas in your car, right? It applies to a certain situation whether you're going to be traveling long distances, but if you're just going to like, but that's contingent on whether or not your gas tank is empty. If your gas tank is full, the like there should be an imperative to fill the gas tank, or if you're just going to drive to the store and back and you don't need to fill the gas tank, then the imperative doesn't apply. It applies to that very specific situation in which your gas tank is empty, or it's going to probably be empty. Yeah, my, my, my big thing is just, it's not an objection to any given action if it's a hypothetical imperative. So that, that's a mistake that people need, that people often make, is they mistake a hypothetical for the categorical. If you understand the, the difference between a hypothetical and a categorical, then there's no problem. I'm just using that as a general example to show how someone could make that mistake. But, yeah, I ask it because I think I do make mistakes. It, like it's, sometimes it's hard to... I think sometimes like the the idea is categorical, but the way it's expressed is hypothetical. Like we like we debated whether or not it would be okay at certain at certain times to use a handicapped parking spot if if the other handicapped parking spots were available. Um, would that be an example of then a hypothetical imperative, not a, not a categorical? With a categorical imperative that disallow that be more, one should follow law that respects the rights of those who are handicapped and not necessarily the specific, you cannot park here. Yeah, I mean, so this is why that would be an immoral act for a regular deontologist. Because the categorical imperative is one should always follow the laws that assist those worst off in society. You'll notice that can be universalized to everyone, right? Whether you're rich or poor, whether you're healthy or sick. So that is a valid categorical imperative. Well, in this case, hypothetically, if you park in a handicapped spot, right, because you are possibly diminishing the resources of those who are the worst off in society, then you would actually be violating that categorical imperative, even though, so this is actually the reverse problem, even though the hypothetical looks like it's okay, as a matter of fact, it would be in conflict with the categorical imperative which is to take care of the worst off in society. But here's, here's also an important thing, a distinction, right? This is why some libertarians be, uh, believe they're Kantians or are Kantians. The very essence of autonomy is that one chooses one's categorical imperatives, right? This is a criticism of Kant. Kant doesn't tell you how to apply the categorical imperative. No, that's not a criticism of Kant. The problem is you're a moral agent and are therefore responsible or autonomous, so it's up to you to apply, right? So a libertarian could create a libertopia that I certainly wouldn't want to live in, which is one has no obligations to anyone else in society, or one has no obligations to anyone else in society except for the law or mutual consent. Now, that could be universalizable just as easily as one has uh, a universal duty to those who are the worst off in society. You'll notice they're conflicting, but both are universalizable. And it's only autonomy that, that gives us the ability or forces on us the responsibility to choose which one. Right? And then, of course, all sorts of hypothetical imperatives will come out of which, whichever one we, we choose. Does that answer slash clarify?
And I guess do you see like great cons and notion of the kingdom of ends itself, like once we all as rational agents develop I, I guess I'll say general will of the categorical imperative. How do you see that sort of playing out? Well this is actually uh, the third um, formulation of the categorical imperative, which I didn't cover, um, which is one should will as though one is willing the kingdom of ends. So th this notion is that what we are is we're in a, a sort of republic of willing. So when we will something for someone else, right, like we should take uh, care of the worse off in our society, we can simultaneously will that as rational agents, but then we're also responsible for everything we will. Right? So then, in turn, if we will that, then we can't park in the handicapped spot. We need to pay a little bit more in taxes for welfare or services, unless we ourselves are in the worst. Um, but yeah, so is that kind of answer clarify? You, I mean, well, the way I read your sub, though, is the general rule itself is strictly based on the notion of universality, of like, natural good of all. And, and so far as what Rousseau wants to say is, once we get out of the state of nature and get into civil society, the way civil society, the way the sovereign actually works is that we all, it, it's basically the people as such in the state and the sovereign in action. But what it is conceptualized as is uh, we will things that are going to be universalizable to everybody. Yeah, well, I mean, again, I'm, I'm going off Kant, not Rousseau. That's but, yeah, true. but yeah, I mean, that, that, there's nothing controversial about that. Um, you can't have a categorical imperative, which is black people don't have the right to vote. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you can't universalize it. Because, as a matter of fact, you're not, not everyone is black. And it would not apply to them. It would not apply to all of us equally. Um, right? So what would happen is it would only apply to a fraction, which would, again, make it a hypothetical imperative, which couldn't possibly be justified by a categorical imperative. Unless one wants to take the incredibly racist position that black people aren't in fact rational subjects, uh, which in fact some people as Kantians try to do. They said black people aren't rational, ergo, um, no rational ends apply to them. Um, but that's a really stupid position to have, and there's no reason for you to have that. So it could conceptually be a problem, but as a matter of fact, it's not a problem. And this goes with all other laws that target a specificity people who are left-handed, women, um, rather than a universal law. Does that qualify? Sure. Okay. Any other questions, objections, clarifications? Uh, so, um, when, you're, when you're looking at bad use subject and uh, the, the non-subject of, of a bad subject, I guess, um, would, that, would that give, um, I guess, a, like a different set of situations for non-subjects of how they would be treated by, say, subjects, or are they still viewed as essentially just non-subjects, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting question. And of course, um, yeah, non-subjects are treated differently by a subject. They have a different relation to the subject. Um, for example, uh, let's go with the party. The party, uh, from Badu's conception and the traditional Marxist-Leninist conception, organizes the proletariat as a class. This means it organizes the proletariat to action. Those proletarians who are not part of the party are inactive. And so, of course, the relation is one of action to inaction. Not necessarily we can do whatever we want with you, um, but that. And so what the party's relation, for example, to the inactive proletariat would be a call, right? A call to justice to the inactive to make them part of the subjectivity, to make them part of the action. What would the subjects call be or uh, action towards capitalists, uh, basically that would be obliteration, right? It'd be a call to justice to obliterate the capitalist law of the superego, right, of the terror, the terror of capitalism. So it, it all depends on what position any given non-subject would have to the subject as such. Is it part of its anxiety, that is to say the masses? Is it part of the revolutionary subject's uh, courage, um, which is to say class struggle? Is it part of the revolutionary party's um, terror, which is to say the dictatorship of the proletariat? Right, because that is the way in which the subject enforces consistency. Right, that's the law of the party is terror. Right, the dictatorship of the proletariat, or is it in relation to justice, which is right communism as such? 
And so any given non-subjective element, right, because there's four virtues, any subjective element will behave different as part of its matrices of the subject. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, and again, I would encourage anyone and everyone to read Alain Badu's theory of the subject, um, which is right there with a giant red flag on it. And at, at the conclusion, when you were talking about just this, I didn't catch, are there individual subjects and the party is the epitome of, of of his conception of subject, or there are no there are no individual subjects, and only the party is. Well, here here's the question, <laughs> or, or here here's here's the difficult answer to your question. For Alain Badiou, there are four discourses. There is science, which includes mathematics. There is uh, art. There is love, and there is politics. The scientific subject is not the scientist. It is the body of work. It is Newtonian physics. It is Einsteinian physics. It is quantum physics. It's tectonic plates, right? It's a body of work. And that forms the very subjectivity of which individual scientists are a part of, right, and working towards. So that would be a scientific subject. The artistic subject would be the body of work, not the artist, right? The body of work is contributed to the artist. And then, of course, this is, this is probably the basic level, or the most individualistic, would be love. The basic subject in love is not an individual, but a couple, right, that expresses love as an action to, together, right, not as one dominating or controlling the other, or one individual subjectively loving another, right. The subject itself engages in certain functions. And so, any, in, no, in, as far as I can tell, no individual is a subject, qua individual. But any given individual could be the very essence of the subject. For example, Einstein asserting himself against previous theories or you know, conflicting theories as Einstein might engage as subject qua subject. Now, the political subject is not an individual. One individual is never political because polyg the political itself is collective action. And the very essence of uh, po actual political action, which is not just administration, right? We live in a, a world of administration where we're administered by the government. But actual political action is through a subjectivity. And that's the party. And the individual is part of that insofar as they act politically as a group. Now, when can an individual be the political? Uh, ironically, this Alain Badiou, and I as well, defend what is pejoratively called the cult of personality. There are some times in the political party, whether Lenin, as you know and may touch on, is declaring himself the party against the Mensheviks and Katuski, um, or Lacan, who declares himself the party against the American um, psychoanalytics, or Mao, who declares himself the party against the revisionists, right? Sometimes this very collective political action is embodied in a single individual. But that's extraordinarily rare. The real question is, what, does the, what are the functions of this entity, of this subject? And so, right, it would be the party. Does that answer, clarify? Yeah, I think so. And, and, and is, is, it, is subjectivity a relationship then, or an action? No, no. I mean, this is yeah. where Alain Badiou and Marxist Leninists are different from Negri. For them, there is no such thing as a revolutionary action, right? Shooting the Tsar might have no actual revolutionary action, like the Decemberists, right? That was an act, but it wasn't revolutionary because there was no subjectivity to carry out the actual revolutionary struggle. So the best way to understand a subject is it's a consistent function that generates outcomes. It's a procedure. Uh, it's a discursive procedure, um, which is not simply reducible to the sum of its parts. Which is why you'll notice every one of those virtues cannot, insofar as they're a subject, cannot be separated and uh, removed from 
each other part, right? Because it's not about just the part or the sum of the parts. It's the function of the parts together that make the subject. Does that clarify? This might also help too. I mean, Bondu actually has a book called Ethics, and what she gives sort of, if I remember correctly, it's three. But if you think about the four things that Greg mentioned, the art, the politics, the love, and science, correct. Um, there's, these are things that generate truth for Badu, and they generate truth out of events. So politics, for example, there's truth in the French Revolution. Right? There's something new that happens, and there's certainly things that get preserved. And one of the main ethics for Badu is showing, expressing fidelity to that truth event, of the event of justice, of overthrowing the monarchy, and declaring the French Revolution as such. And so to express bad fidelity to an event like that, for Badu is unethical. And the other two he consists of are um, to name a void, which would be like the Nazis naming purity, as to where the communists named justice. Justice is a concept we can actually articulate in the world. Purity, like, right, what is purity as such? There's nothing really. If I may interject real here, I'll uh, real quickly here, right? This would be a non subject, right? Because the Nazis don't call to justice. What they call to is the law, the law of purity, the law of race, right? So they might have, they do have anxiety. They might have. Well, they don't even have courage, right? What they are is an anxious terror over race. So, right, they would not constitute a subject proper. Um, but when he says fidelity to an event, to a truth, it's a truth procedure. The subject generates a, a truth procedure. Now, what does that mean? October Revolution. Who declares the October Revolution? Yes, Lenin, but it's the party. And it's not just that there's a bunch of people that makes it happen, but there's a subject which can carry through with the October Revolution, right? To storm the Winter Palace. And it's not just retroactive that you say, oh, I'm expressing fidelity to the event, but you assert that event as having already happened. At the eve of the October Revolution, Lenin asserts the October Revolution, which has not happened chronologically, but has happened subjectively for the political subject of the Bolsheviks, which allows him to seize the state. Does that difference make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, if there's one more, I'll take one more, but then I'm going to turn it over to Johnny Boy. All right. Thank you.